ಅಭಿಪ್ರಾಯ ಓಂ ಗಣಾನ ಆಂಧ್ವಾ ಗಣಪತಿ ಗಂಭವಾಮಹೆ ಕವಿ ಕವೀನಾಂ ಉಪಮಶ್ರವಶ್ತಮ ಜ್ಯೇಷ್ಠರಾಜ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮಣ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮಣಸ್ಪತ ಆನ ಶೃಣ್ವನೋತಿ ಸೀತ ಸಾಧನ ಓಂ ಶ್ರೀ ಮಹಾಗಣಪತ ನಮಃ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ನಾರಾಯಣಾಯ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ನಾರಾಯಣಾಯ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ನಾರಾಯಣಾಯ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಓಂ 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 ನಮ ಶಿವಾಯ ಗುಡ್ ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಅವರ್ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಓ ಕ್ಲಾಕ್ ಓರ್ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಜೀರೋ ಏಟ್ ಓ ಕ್ಲಾಕ್ ನ್ಯೂಸ್ ಗುಡ್ ನ್ಯೂಸ್ ಸೊ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಡೂಯಿಂಗ್ ದಿಸ್ ವೀಕ್ಲಿ ಸತ್ಸಂಗ್ ಹೋಪ್ಲಿ ಆಸ್ ವೀಕ್ಲಿ ಆಸ್ ವಿ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ may have to skip one or two here and there but i hope you don't mind that uh so tonight we're continuing with a power of thought um and kind of any relevant uh, subjects uh, so we'll see what we what comes up tonight um <clears throat> swami shivananda says as you think so you become so many people have said probably the same thing um, um Buddha was uh, saying the same thing many different speakers so as you think so you become if you saw a thought you reap an action if you saw an action you reap a uh, um tendency if you saw a tendency you reap a habit if you saw a habit you reap a character if you saw a character you reap a destiny so this way we can decide to build any destiny we want provided that we are careful about first of all what kind of thoughts we have in the mind and also to realize that it is our own power to determine what kind of thoughts we want to uh, cultivate majority of, my, of us are not really first of all knowledgeable about the reality of the thought world and also at the same time we seem to not really mind too much if some negative thoughts are here and there or we just not able to really uh deal with them and so here we have to remember that every thought is by itself is a creative entity of you know power and if we if we maintain the thoughts of the same quality for a sustainable time and also if we're able to invest a particular thought with a feeling and charge it with some kind of a deeper emotion we'll find that these thoughts will come to realization uh, uh sooner than if we were just to think positive thoughts just like this so knowing the these four five sentences <clears throat> we can repeat them and remind ourselves of their power and so we our goal is to really <clears throat> think feel and live consciously and deliberately and so far we've been living sometimes consciously sometimes deliberately but most of the time mechanically so this mechanical thinking is also behind all issues and problems that we as humanity we have uh mechan- the mechanical thinking is also the problem behind the lack of creative thinking because the creative thinking cannot be had along mechanical thinking mechanical thinking has a lot to do with our past conditioning and it's uh, sometimes very based on simply just living or doing the things again and again or sometimes an instinctive uh or it's based on our instinctive nature so a lot of things are there so how do we break out the mechanical thinking this is the biggest uh, i would say question for every human being and we can simply start by increasing the awareness the word that is very favored these days um we can ask ourselves what what am i thinking about and so the idea is that we must become aware of every phenomena that may take place in our mind and this is uh, easier said than done so we need to have some level plan and uh, along with that we need to meditate also along with that we need to keep some higher standard of ethics we must increase our purity our commitments uh you know gratefulness uh truthfulness so all these virtues go to build a very powerful um thought power in us so <clears throat> asking a frequent question of what am i thinking about it will help you intercept whatever the mechanical process of thinking is there and then another way to to think about is is what kind of a guna 
or quality is with is within my mind and recognizing the guna will allow us to also know how to modify it for example for all of you who are guna familiar uh, when the tamas manifests there is a, a, a great resistance in nature uh, not just that there is a lack of sensitivity and other things, but there's a resistance to trying to even do something about the tamasic uh, nature of our mind at that particular moment. But also we have to remember that that will change. So um, I'm not going to go into details of it, but also we need to know if our mind is very kind of either agitated or overly excited or overly identified with something. So what should we do about that at that particular time. So to try to do the analysis of, uh, of your guna state. And then uh, this way you will discover that whenever the question arises, what is going on within my mind? What kind of a thought I have? You will discover that it is the habit, it is the ruling power behind our lives. As much as habits are sometimes necessary, you know, in some simple things such as driving and all that, we still need to try to bring as much light of awareness into our life as possible. So um, now going back to where we left off last time, we were discussing about the nature of thoughts and the different uh, uh, qualities of it and how our mind attracts whatever we think of. I mean, whatever the vibration of the mind we maintain, that particular vibration we attract to one another. So we exist in a world wherein different types of minds act as different satellites and there's a continuous transmission of thoughts and there is only some, some, some aspects of these thoughts that are known to us, to the conscious mind. Majority of it, probably over 95% will be the thoughts which, uh, which we're not aware of, which come in from other people, other beings, other planets, name it. So we don't need to know all of these, of course, we cannot know them in a linear kind of a sense, but we can also at least become aware of their qualities. Once we become aware of the quality of thoughts, that is uh, the first biggest step that you can make in your spiritual life. A person who doesn't consciously cultivate good, positive, pure, of higher degree thoughts, it's like a gardener who is not, um, who is expecting that without any work, he will have all the best fruits or the best vegetables or bushes in his or her garden. So we need to understand uh, all the laws that govern the thoughts and we can only do it when we use our mind as kind of a laboratory. Uh, so we use our own mind for perfecting our own understanding of thoughts, processes and everything. So um, we said something last time, how different places also have different kind of vibrations. Um, and if one, for example, wants to go to a, another country or another place, you come under the influence of the composite thought of those places or those countries. And naturally, we have uh, a country that is, um, naturally we have a, a, a country, for example, which has a particular type of composite thought or vibration, but nevertheless is broken into more local kind of areas. So um, <clears throat> uh, if you do not understand how this works, then if you remain for a long time in a single location, then what can happen is that you may start to get influenced by that place uh, in a way that it will start to change the way you think. It will start to shift your priorities in your mind like that. And so that influence can happen uh, and it can, it can influence you in a such a way in spite of yourself. So then a change obviously begins to manifest in a person who spends a long time in a particular area. So either that change affects the mind in a way that the person kind of rises in some ways or sinks in some ways. I mean, the mind rises or the mind sinks to the level of that prevailing thought or the composite thought of a particular locality 
or community or anything like that. For example, now you're living, if you're living in New York City, where there's a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety about a lot of different things, and this city is usually like that. It, you may call it the bustling city, but it's a bustling thought city. So there are all kinds of thoughts from the lowest to the highest. We know from uh, certain experiences that this particular city sits on kind of a chakra, which is like a psychic center of the planet, not necessarily with the highest vibration, but it is the vibration of activity, let's say of your third chakra, which is your Manipura chakra, like this. We can say more things about this, but that's also this kind of thoughts to, to be prevalent in, in your mind. In a normal conditions, that would be the money type of thing, maybe with some, of course, other more sublime aspects of music and arts and different things. As, you, as everyone knows, in every city, you can find everything, especially in such, this large city. So now if you allow yourself to do two things, one is to read the news continuously, which is not the best thing, and to kind of submerge yourself unconsciously in the atmosphere of the city, which now is completely obviously overwhelmed by fear or kind of things then you can sink down to it and you can wake up you know with depressed and you can start to doubt whatever little good work you may be doing in your spiritual practices so of course even though we can recognize the presence of certain vibration as normal we still have to do our best to rise above the vibration to keep our mind clear so this is how you have to think of whenever you're living someplace, you have to actually as a yogi or yogini, you have to rise above the prevalent vibration of the city, unless the city is a holy city where you're living, or you're living on a Ganga river, or you're living in Himalayas someplace. But even there, you always have to have your own world. You have to create it through your own continuous like thoughts, um, continues uh, adapting or adjusting the vibration of your mind to a higher level since you've already set up certain standards in your life now you just have to know how to do it the easiest one of the easiest methods of uh, coming to that place of a higher vibration is to simply repeat the mantras and read read exclusively the books written by realized masters or you know inspirational books uh, not to you know re, uh, listen to the inspiration of music, you know expose yourself to the beneficial influences. <clears throat> it is because in the name of some kind of democracy, especially in this country, where every possible influence is allowed, is that you have a nation that is falling apart, and this is what's happening to the world in general. You cannot allow. allow the tamasic influences and rajasic influences to be equal to sattvic influences. If that's the case, then of course, the, the, the tamas and rajas being instinctive areas of human nature, people will be always drawn to it, especially if they're not protected and shielded from a young age. So I always say, you know, if you don't want to have, you know, people with, you know, you know, minds that they cannot control them, negative minds, unethical minds, then take the literature out away or hide it someplace. Now, of course, the internet is a big thing. Everything influences our mind. And whatever you expose yourself to, to it will influence your mind. So therefore, a yogi or spiritual person like that, yogini, or whatever tradition they belong to, they have to be very strict about the influences they allow in their lives. And you can't mix them. Like there may be mixing when you're growing up, you're kind of exploring here and there different things. But when you get to a certain stage where you realize that <clears throat> uh, maintaining a high vibration of mind is like a, walking a very fine line, you know, or balance or walking along the cliff, you can easily drop down. And it happens to every one of us. So the way to, of course, keep this up, as I said, one is the mantra, you can do pranayama, asanas, all these things shift the vibration provided you do it with the correct attitude. And certainly satsanga, the company of spiritually minded people. I cannot say enough how, how, um, 
uh, how much people don't think that other influences are important like to, to we have to be basically selective about what comes into our life and you have to be ruthlessly selective about what comes into your life and how you also how you actually handle or schedule your time because if you don't give at least one hour of your time to your building of your mind, you will not be able to resist this vibration of the world and other things it will pull you down. And you may think, oh, this is just me being weak. No, it's not necessarily. We can be as strong as we like, but you're dealing with, with a vibration of millions of people that come together, right? So we want to bring millions of people who think high quality of thoughts. And that, that's possible. So coming back to the story here, whenever we go and we spend some time in a particular place, and we're influenced by that particular you know, place, by the energy vibration, meaning by the composite thought built up by those people who live there or who live there. So therefore, i give you an example. When, as a person like myself, goes to India, and I go to Himalayas and I go to some beautiful holy places. Then what happens even just being in, in the Himalayas, in Rishikesh or in Shivananda Ashram or some place like this, whatever, there's millions of temples and places like this, as you know. Not just India, but let's say for myself, I go there, you feel so spiritually uplifted. You feel like this all the world of this greed and, and rushing and everything. It just seems so abnormal. So um, this is some of the influence that we get when we go to India. India kind of stimulates and stirs up our some scars of the of the, you know, of the desire to for self liberation, all kinds of things. And for all of you who've been to India, you probably will agree with me at least to some degree. Now I'm not saying that we the West we're really a bad place. In fact, we have many wonderful things. But spiritually speaking. The Western society is not as spiritual as it's supposed to be, in spite of the prevalence of, you know, so many spiritual people and tradition of Christianity and everything. Of course, it varies from city to city, from group to group. But when you come to the West, initially, you know, people may keep some of their spiritual practices. For example, Swami Shivananda speaks about this, even when people from these Eastern countries arrive to the West, initially they keep their, their practices, for example, spiritual practice, whatever, and then slowly they get modified, right? Because we in the West more interested in materialistic side of life. We are also interested more in enjoyments of things. We provide more of this and we also work very hard. So people are kind of, you know, pulled into that and they start to like it and it's okay the, the whole idea is that we also have other things arts and music and all that but the whole idea is when you go someplace you do get changed the longer you stay there the more you get changed and so the atmosphere of holy places whether in the west or east whether let's say you go to churches or temples or you know holy places are everywhere all over the world they can change and charge your mind it can change the vibration of your mind to an incredible degree however it's hard to sustain this because you will be moving and going somewhere else so as i said himalayas are very beautiful um, not just that they're beautiful physically the important places the millions of sages live there some of the greatest minds that ever popul pop populated the earth will live there so even today, if you go to the caves of, of, a, of a great Tibetan yogi, Milarepa, you could still feel dense energy that is created by all his meditations and everything. So now I'm talking about, about us being spiritual people and entering to these places. We'll feel some deep change and reverence and all kinds of other things. You go to, for example, Israel, and you visit the places where Jesus lived and he taught, you can feel it. If you just allow yourself a little bit, the, all the greatness of that master, regardless of whether people say, oh, this church is not in the same place where he was really before, it's, you know, 100 yards there. Anyway, the, the whole of the sages 
presence and, and realization kind of fills the atmosphere of these places. So we have this all over the world. We go, when we go to Shivananda's ashram in Rishikesh, we feel the presence of, of Swami Shivananda. It, in fact, it is said the great master may decided that after some after leaving, leave some small, uh, some aspect of his subtle body that, to permeate that particular place like an ashram or, or whatever, the cave and something like this for the benefit of other aspirants. It is like that world, uh, thought world is so amazingly rich and, and it has to be used for right reasons. Now, the powerful energy of such places, for example, when you go to Indian temples, some of these temples are thousands of years old, and we do not even know how much worship goes on a daily basis. So imagine, we have some, such, such places in the West too, of course, but imagine the places that have been used specifically for the worship and of, of, of the divine. So what happens is that such a place exerts an incredible influence um, it almost, you could say, it impinges on our aura uh, to the, especially of those people who have faith in this kind of teachings. And then what it does, it, it breaks through all the little crusts that may be there that prevent the right influence of, uh, of the energy, of the high energy of flowing into our, our astral body in this uh, case. And, and they basically purify us. We may not be aware of any of that because very few people know, but what will happen as a result of having visited the holy place, your aura is pure. And then what happens you is uh, are ready to take on a greater influence of pure vibrations and a higher frequency of energy. This is why it's important to go on pilgrimages and uh, there are other reasons also behind it, but the best thing to do is to always go to places which are spiritually charged, you know, and you will slowly, as you meditate, you become more sensitive. You will start to feel, you will feel just like a healer feels certain places in your body. You will be able to feel the places like that. So the energy and the characteristics of a place can be modified in some other ways. For example, if this place, a local place, is filled with certain people, you will have a certain composite thought, um, thought formation. But now we bring a new set of thinkers there. Let's say we bring some yogis into these places. We make people meditate every day, or at least those few people meditate. Okay, so what will happen? They will soon start to change the composite thought of the place, consciously, unconsciously. Have you noticed that even individually, um, when, after you've taken up some practices of yoga and whatever else you do, is when the other people meet you who have known you for a long time, you come to them and they say, oh my God, you've changed. You look so different. Like something is like, you know, more peaceful in you. And you, you know, and, and sometimes people may say, well, you know, you, you have actually influenced me to start with the practice of yoga or practice of meditation. Not just through lectures. This is nothing, but to just the pure presence of yourself. You know, in other people, if you genuinely practiced anything, that becomes part of yourself. What I say is like this, whatever you have genuinely practiced and whatever was uh, kind of created through the power of your sadhana becomes a permanent part of you. When I say a permanent part of you, meaning permanent part of your aura, that will outlive your physical body. It is that which you take as the only gift when you leave this body. All the book learning and all these thousands of books, you throw this through the window, it doesn't really help after we leave this planet. So what works the best is to work on as few principles, do your daily sadhana, do whatever duties you have to do, of course, and then through the power of your practice, you will build certain permanent centers in your aura that will be further Im uh, be impacted by the higher influences, and that is what we may call a charisma. See, that you can have different types of charismas, but we're talking here about yogic charisma. 
we're not talking about the the charisma necessarily of a person who is just you know uh you know an, a good actor uh, whether he's a president or not we don't know but anyway we th th this is not the charisma we're speaking about we're talking about the charisma being you but the best of you each one of us comes with a certain um you know possibility to really uh, becomes a very special being because even we are individuals so we bring certain gifts into this life each one of us different but we have to allow them to grow now charisma doesn't mean that you have to have you know <clears throat> 10,000 people on your Twitter account or Instagram this is not to do charisma just means that your presence speaks more than your words and the reason why that that is is because whatever the practices you have done mastered or you're still working on they imprinted in you they rub off other people's auras and their thinking process is influenced by your presence and that's what we want since we're only interested in peaceful things we want a new life here altogether so if you bring a few yogis I mean, this is a big group we have tonight. We have a, what, what about uh, 46 people in this uh, little satsang. So 46 people are, are power. I'm not saying that I'm a power, you're power, but together we are power. Okay, so we become like a bunch of energetic thinkers, right? In each one of our areas, and we influence that composite you know thought of the place of the locality and everything so if there's a lot of negativity coming a lot of worry about what's going to happen with our jobs economy and everything we bring some hope you know we bring by hope and even if we felt hopeless before meeting like this we feel more hopeful afterwards so uh, the duty of a yogi is to bring the hope hope to those who are hopeless and to bring some healing to those people who are feeling vulnerable and to bring some light to those people who are like, you know, taken into the darkness. This is our job. And we do it by waking up in the morning, doing our pranayama, removing our own darkness, removing our own little things, because that's how it begins. We cannot influence other people without first removing our own darkness. And everyone has their own darkness and it's okay. You came into this life with certain, you know, little weaknesses here and there and with a lot of potential. So we are concentrating on, uh, on the great potential. So what the yogis, and I have to say this, the yogis who are real sadhana, sadhaks, what they do, they influence the composite thought of humanity you know, there are great meditators all over the world who may not be ever be known to any one of us, and they yet the powerful thought forms, they're blasting the negative things. There's like a, like a, you know, a star war out there going. So you, you know, the positive influences are blasting the negative influences. They're sending a lot of thoughts of hope to all of us. Now, some of these yogis may not be physically alive. That's also interesting because you can tune your mind to some greatly, great master, realized master, from a yogi to, you know, Jesus or anyone you like, there will be a power coming back to you. And this is how we, we do it. In a way, you know, meditation is also like, a, from one point of view, it's like a, a way of tuning to these higher vibrations. So the positive thoughts of the powerful thoughts of a few powerful thinkers can overcome the weaker thoughts of those who are weaker thinkers in a spiritual sense. And sometimes they can help also overcome the weak and purposeless thoughts that many people have watching TV, you know, dulling themselves then we did this also okay we enjoyed watching tv having french fries and then whatever else pizza and the coca-cola and they lasted for a good whatever number of years we got tired of it we threw the pizzas through the window of course we still have it on saturday but still at least five days we don't have pizza we don't have french fries we don't have a tv every day if you do have a tv my recommendation is get rid of it you don't need it Naturally, or everything is on the computer now. So, uh, you know, you just change the vibration. 
start from your home. Your home is the beginning of, it's like you create, you know, people buy crystals to send off, you know, powerful thoughts by the, by the means of crystals and things. Well, you create your home into a crystal, you know, create it into a Shiva Lingam or whatever you like. So here's the interesting thing. People who live in a sort of smaller places, I said this before, but I just want to add something like more maybe tamasic, right? Less activity, more kind of drinking, some bad habits here and there, like, you know, uh, barbecuing, wasting time, doing things like that. So sometimes you can enter into this kind of a, a very dr like a dreamy, sleepy, almost dead community, right? If you spend your time there and you're not thinking like a yogi, soon you will find that you slow down, you want to barbecue, and you know, it gradually sink to the level of, the, of that kind of a town or village. Now, I'm not saying that all villages and all towns have that energy, but sometimes it's like that. When you live in a Rajasic city, like primarily New York, with some small sattva and also pretty much a lot of tamas, so what happens depending on your own vibration, you find what, what attracts you <clears throat> um, and what you're attracted to. So when you live in the city like this, then you also have to protect yourself, for example, from overworking, overthinking your finances all the time. Like this is the general vibration here. People work and that's, you know, there are millions of people make millions of dollars. But the problem is that most of them overworked. And even if they go somewhere else, they don't have any change of vibration. So we want a completely different world. So we want sattvic, sattvic. Now, sattvic is not possible. So what I'm saying now, <clears throat> sattva only exists in small percentage in relation to Rajasen Thomas. The only time when there's more sattva guna is the satya yuga, right? Satya yuga is like a, the time when it was of higher vibration, very sattvic, right? And then it was changed into more rajasic, rajasic, rajasic. And now we have in Kali Yuga, we have rajasic, tamasic, and then more tamasic like this. So just look at the, if you think of, let's say our country here, the US, you can see how many people have addictions. You know, there are 46,000 registered drug users in the New Jersey alone. So this is a lot of people, you see? So now we have to think, how did this come about? We're not blaming any people, right? We're blaming, we can blame everybody and anybody, but obviously this is not the way that we have to, we should go about. So the Thomas is there, the Rajas is there, the loss of potential of life is there, and then there will be a further domino influence on other generations. So this needs to be stopped by, as I said, my favorite thing, bring yoga into schools, prisons everywhere, bring meditation, prisons, schools everywhere, bring ethics everywhere. All yogis must speak ethics, must speak transparency, must speak about problems with ethics, must speak everything. Without that, we don't have much of a knowledge, the means to, to work with the very heavy influence of Thomas and Rajas in these modern times. So basically, an average person is influenced generally by the general thought vibrations of any locality. But if a person is strong, if there's regular sadhana, that person will not be affected easily. Although there may be factors that will weaken somebody's uh, spiritual practices and somebody's strength like that. <clears throat> so it is important to keep our vibration, thought vibration very, very high. And I, I'm sure you will be able to do it. Now we are influenced, we are all so happy by just gathering together. In some ways, I think if it wasn't for this coronavirus, we would never have this kind of many satsangs and meetings and have wonderful things. So, <clears throat> you see, as a person, each person is different. Some people carry a very like light energy about them. They maybe have about them an atmosphere of cheer, optimism, and courage, and other things. And there are people who carry a very heavy energy, right? They walk in, you, you make you, they make you feel absolutely immediately miserable you know, if you allow it to be. They have a certain disharmony in them. They create uneasiness. 
you see so these are the personal um, personal responsibilities of the people for example if I feel depressed I then I shouldn't go out and infect somebody it is like an infection you know it's like a virus a depression or negative thinking or complaining so sometimes we go like this out and hope, hopefully we'll find some victim and we can infect a little bit you know so we need to make sure that before we actually talk before we even you know think what we must do is must you do your best to rise let's say like this before you doing anything before saying something get into the habit into rising mentally as high as you can to the to a high point <clears throat> it's like uh, climbing up the mountain from which you can see very clearly what's going on um, at the bottom so similarly we want to look at our situations our, our interactions with others from a higher perspective so if I find myself in a bad mood, it's quite likely that when I open my door and I meet somebody, I'm going to actually project that bad mood outside. So whose responsibility it is? I will say it is the responsibility of that person that annoyed me that did something like this, but it's actually not true. <clears throat> um, unknowingly, I let myself, uh, let my vibration level drop. And so I went, you know, into the room and then I spoke to this person and then the disaster came. So <clears throat> if you have nothing to do and whenever you have a few spare moments, I know this is rare these days, try to draw inwards and imagine that you're climbing to a higher level it's like a, you know, a little mental hill that you have and you go high, high up. And then when the time comes to act and make a decision or interact with another person, then the way forward will be clear and you will do the right thing. <clears throat> it's like this. Anything you want to do, ask yourself, can I bring my vibration higher up? Before I do this, before I say this and like that. So <clears throat> what happens is that Many people neglect this kind of a practice, right? They're not able to, to recognize that the mind has been lowered, you know, to a lower vibration. So what happens is that they're often lost. They feel unhappy. They don't even know it. So it is the, it's the other people that somehow in interaction show, show, show them that they're, they're not happy. So, what happens then if you're not shielded by your higher vibration by standing a little bit above the general mental atmosphere in the house or wherever you are then there's you you may end up acting on an impulse or, or without reflection and this is this is not good so we need to go in a different way here so we have to always rise above where we are so go within and meditate before you make any decisions. This is the best thing that we can do. So now going back to the idea of uh, my favorite subject, of course, the law of attraction here. Um, we know that we uh, attract certain thoughts and we also repel certain thoughts. And what we're attracting is something that is similar to our general vibration. So these different thoughts in the world that people have, or let's say even in a city of, uh, in, in a community, they form a, a stratus of thought in astral place, just as clouds fall into groups in the atmosphere. So how do you will visualize this? Not exactly that, that doesn't mean that each thought occupies a particular location or certain portion of a space to the exclusion of all others. But it is rather that the same, the thought vibrations obviously of different degrees and they can, the same space can be filled, can be filled, sorry, with thought matter of thousand kinds. Okay, so without interference with one another. Can you believe that? Let's say we have a large room and we have quite a few guests and because we don't have 
enough rooms, we have 10 people sleeping in our room. So what happens then is that 10 people is like, they occupy the same physical space, but they kind of exist in 10 different worlds, as if to say, you know, everybody, one is dreaming he is in Himalayas, another one is in Jamaica, another one is dreaming something else like this. So in your dream world, you know, even though physically you're in the same place, astrally that has nothing to do with the physical aspect of it. So we could say that different thought vibrations can exist within the same space, like this city, let's say. And that means that the same space is filled with the thought matter of all kinds. And this is done without interference uh, with each other except with some variety of thoughts, okay? So even though the city or the community may be in a, in a negative state right now, this coronavirus, we can still build a positive vibration and your positive thought and my positive thought and something like that will meet and will strengthen one another. So each individual like this draws to himself or herself the thoughts corresponding to those that that person thinks that you produce in your mind. And it that person, of course, in turn inf is influenced by those thoughts that are attracted. So I will finish up by just saying a couple of important things. One is that the power of thought is determined or depends on several aspects. One is the uh, degree of concentration so that means that the more concentrated the person is, the more powerful the thought is. If our mind is uh, dissipated, we cannot accomplish that what we want to accomplish uh, by the means of thought. So the first thing is degree of concentration. The second one is degree of purity. Remember, the more, the purer the thought, the more powerful it becomes. You know, the more, the greater the range of that thought is. The third uh, aspect is the quality of emotion. The thought is not powerful on its own. It needs to be kind of powered up by a feeling. So if you're praying for somebody, you can pray almost mentally. You can say, oh, okay, good. You can say the mantra like this. But if there's no feeling to it, you can say, oh, I rely on the power of mantra. It's correct. But there are millions of pundits. They repeat the mantras and it's nothing. They're the same people that will be going willing and dealing. So what you want to do is whatever little you know, mantra-wise or practice-wise or thinking-wise, you Yep, you put a power or power you're feeling. Now, the power of feeling may not be exactly genuine in the beginning, but as you, as you continue to practice, you will start to kind of, um, it's like a putting a mantle around the thought. It's going to start to feel heavier and more palpable, and it's going to be more present in your life. So you got that third one is the emotion. For example, any imaginations that you, sorry, visualizations that you do, they need to be powered by emotion. If you don't power them by emotion, they're like just some intellectual exercises. They will have some effect, but not quite as deep. Then the next one, which is called a quality of intention. So emotion and intention. So intention is important with which that thought is charged. What exact, what the exact objective is of that thought that you have? So this intention, what it does, it almost sets, sets, it activates. On one side, it activates and releases the prana from your own body. And it starts to act as a kind of a signal that goes out and in search of a similar type of vibration. So that's where the intention is important. So your own personal thought gets amplified and powered by what you are thinking. So if you have a strong intention, there is a greater surge of prana that accompanies that uh, projected thought. So this is like how it goes. A powerful thought is like when you, it's like a bullet, you know, that goes towards the target or mark. And important, the important thing is like this. 
Um, I spoke a little bit about charisma in, from my own perspective, right? A person who is able to send a powerful or vigorous positive thought, consciously or unconsciously, in, says it with a lot of prana, okay? So what happens is the person has, it influences the other minds who may be, uh, whose vibration may be either similar or lower. So some public speakers like this have acquired this art and they have an art of impacting other minds. Now that charisma could be negative or could be positive because again, when you say negative charisma, that's not, gonna, that's not going to influence you. It's going to influence those people who have a similar vibrational thought to that other person. So this uh, idea is that um, the charisma is really the ability to draw on one's own power of thought and, and to invest it with certain energy and emotional energy and project it out there. So it's the result of this lifetime and past lifetime practices. So there are also different orders of thoughts and the higher order of thought is the stronger it is. It's again, high order means in the degree of purity and truthfulness and everything. So if the person's mind is filled with, po with love, positive thoughts like this, that is the high order of thought. So that kind of a thought is many more times powerful than you know, any other thought. So of course the highest power thoughts have only the masters, those people who possessed of a tremendous spiritual development. And so those are the masters that sent to us many wonderful thoughts of waves and strength and hope and so on. So with this, I've finished the first part of the thought power, uh, you know, we can get into other aspects of, of thought power, but this is the first one. We just discussed some general qualities, characteristics of thought world. So I hope you enjoyed it and um, we we'll see you hopefully next week. So I'm going to just say Om, Om, Om. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purna Purnamada Chate Purnasya Purnamada Purnameva Vashishate Om Shanti 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 Om Sadhguru Shivan Maraj Ki Jai Bhushishan Devan Maraj Ki Jai Namah Shivaya